Greetings, and welcome back to the channel. We're halfway through the decade, one that so far featured many mad scientists, monsters, and the occasional time travel film. There's still a fair share of mad scientists and monsters this year, but we'll also discuss some alternate reality war propaganda, robots, and Martians. A nice change of pace that will continue as sci-fi cinema heads towards its golden age in the 1950s. This was a time of transition for society. With World War II ending this year, and the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought the horrors of scientific advancements to the forefront. Later, the genre will explore the profound effects that a single invention could have on the world, both positive and negative, and the question whether these technologies were being used appropriately. One animated short film, Post-War Inventions from Terry Toons, looks at the future of technology with awe and wonder, and how society could benefit. It does remind me of the modern invention short from 1937. Both take a humorous look at what the future could hold for society. But it is important to note that Post-War Inventions was released in March of 1945, months before the world knew of the atomic bomb. I wonder what dreams Gandy Goose and Sourpuss the Cat would have had in August of 1945. There are only two sequels in this episode, both from Universal, and we have reached the end of an era for the Universal Monsters. House of Dracula from House of Frankenstein and the Ghost of Frankenstein director Earl C. Kenton is Universal Pictures' last serious portrayal of the iconic horror figures Frankenstein's monster, Dracula, and the Wolfman, before the studio shifted towards horror comedies such as Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein in 1948. This is due to budget cuts, studio restructuring, and reducing the number of low-budget productions in the mid-1940s. But this film is more horror than sci-fi, though it does continue to feature scientific means of curing supernatural afflictions. In this installment, we follow Dr. Franz Edelman, played by Onslow Stevens, who is approached by both Count Dracula and Lawrence Talbot, a.k.a. the Wolfman, for cures to their supernatural afflictions. Dracula is secretly plotting to seduce Edelman's beautiful assistant, while Talbot genuinely seeks relief from his lycanthropy. Of course, Frankenstein's monster is discovered in a cave, and Dracula's schemes are uncovered. Bella Lugosi, who famously betrayed Dracula in 1931, was initially considered but unavailable due to other commitments. And so John Carradine was brought in to reprise his role of Dracula from House of Frankenstein. The film also features Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman and Glenn Strange as Frankenstein's monster, with Lionel Atwill appearing for his fifth time in a Universal Frankenstein film. Newcomers to the universe include Onslow Stevens, who we saw in previous episodes discussing 1934's The Vanishing Shadow, 1935's Life Returns, and 1941's The Monster and the Girl, as well as Martha O'Driscoll, Jane Addams, and Ludwig Stossel. The production was only given $5,000 for sets, and so they reused sets from The Invisible Woman and The Mummy's Hand. The studio also reused footage from previous Frankenstein films, showing off other versions of the monster. Low lighting was used to hide the cheap sets, which was standard for low-budget films of the time. With the original title of Wolfman vs. Dracula, the film was reworked in pre-production due to Hayes Code's issues. The monster and Nina were added to a new version of the script and retitled House of Dracula. Despite its attempts to blend horror and science fiction through mad scientist tropes and experimental cures, House of Dracula received mixed reviews but was a modest hit. The New York Daily News said it, quote, positively guaranteed not to scare the pants off of anybody. Unfortunately, the film hasn't the capacity of being funny either, unquote. But Variety did call it first-rate work. The film also marked the end of legendary makeup artist Jack Pierce's involvement with Universal's iconic monsters, whose work goes back to 1931's Frankenstein, as his contract ended in 1947 and wasn't renewed. 
Universal would bring back Bela Lugosi as Dracula in 1948's Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. And many of these characters will live on in remakes and new adaptations from a variety of directors including Mel Brooks, Francis Ford Coppola, Kenneth Branagh, and studios like Hammer Film Productions. This isn't a bad film if you watch it outside the context of the much better Universal films of the 1930s. Carradine has more to do in this sequel, but he really should be the main character in a film called House of Dracula. Onslow Stevens does a good job in the leading role, dealing with all these classic monster characters. House of Dracula is available on DVD and Blu-ray, on the Dracula Complete Legacy Collection, and Frankenstein Complete Legacy Collection, and streaming on the Internet Archive. The Jungle Captive is the final film in Universal Pictures' Ape Woman series, blending horror with science fiction elements. Directed by Harold Young, an American filmmaker and editor known for his work on B-movies, the film represents a low-budget production characteristic of Universal's genre entries in the 1940s. The story centers around Dr. Stendhal, played by Otto Kruger, a mad scientist who aims to resurrect Paula Dupree, the ape woman who died at the end of the second film, using experimental scientific methods. Assisted by his disfigured helper Moloch, Dr. Stendhal kidnaps Anne Forrester, his lab assistant, to use her blood in his reanimation experiment on the dead ape woman. Paula is brought back to life for a short time, leading to a series of the usual chaotic confrontations and yet another sci-fi and horror hybrid that looks into the ethical dilemma of scientist. Vicky Lane takes on the role of Paula Dupree, replacing Aquanetta, who refused to return to the franchise, while Phil Brown, who would later gain fame as Owen Lars in Star Wars, appears as Don Young. Rondo Hatton, who plays Moloch, had acromegaly, a rare disorder that leads to the enlargement of bones and tissues. This disorder was used for dramatic effect as a plot device in 1944's The Monster Maker, and he brings a unique and eerie presence to the character without overemphasizing the disease. The film is marked by its use of familiar horror tropes, such as the mad scientist and the reanimated creature, which some critics found tiresome. The New York Herald Times delivered a scathing review, saying, quote, I have come to the unalterable conviction that I just don't like motion pictures in which a fanatical doctor disinters werewolves, wolfmen, troglodytes, and the like to bring them back to life with dire results. Even if they were good, I wouldn't like them. But there's no danger of that in the case of Jungle Captive. Unquote. While the film may not be as celebrated as other entries in the studio's monster film catalog, it remains a noteworthy part of Universal's horror legacy for featuring a female monster but it is one of the many mad scientist films of the time that is entertaining enough for its short runtime. This was my favorite of the trilogy, even though Paula has little to do in this film. Vicky Lane didn't bring anything to the character originated by Aquanetta, other than to serve as a plot device for the mad scientist. The side characters are more interesting and the plot moves faster than the first two films in the trilogy. The Jungle Captive is available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as streaming on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. Before we dive into the rest of the films of 1945, if you're enjoying the content, please hit like and subscribe for more episodes in the history of sci-fi cinema. You can also support my work on Patreon, which I'll link in the description below. Your support means a lot, and I appreciate everyone stopping by to share their love for this amazing genre. Strange Holiday, directed by Arch Obler, delivers a stark and unsettling vision of a dystopian America overtaken by unnamed fascist forces. The film stars Claude Rains as John Stevenson, an ordinary American businessman who returns from a secluded fishing trip to discover his country has been transformed into a totalitarian state. This new regime has stripped away personal freedoms, leaving Stevenson to grapple with a society that has dramatically shifted in his short absence. The film delves into themes of complacency 
and the vulnerability of democracy, depicting Stevenson's desperate attempts to understand and resist the sudden authoritarian shift. It's not the typical science fiction story. There are no aliens, robots, or mad scientists, but an alternate reality. This idea often found in science fiction, like Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle, allowing writers and creators to explore different possibilities. Strange Holiday was initially produced as a propaganda short film for General Motors to counter negative publicity related to its connections to its European affiliates making cars for Germany during the war. General Motors commissioned the film in 1940, before the U.S. entered the war, to promote patriotism and appreciation for American freedoms. Obler, known for his political anti-fascist views, had originally attended for the project as a cautionary tale, so GM shelved the film. And then it was sold to MGM in 1941, but was never released. Eventually, Obler and Reigns acquired the rights and reworked it into a feature-length drama. Distributed by the Producers Releasing Corporation, a Poverty Row studio, Strange Holiday was released on May 6, 1945, a few short days before the official end of the war in Europe. While the film does not explicitly mention Nazis, the bad guys are clearly Germans. Its release was limited in 1945, with a broader release in 1946 to capitalize on Claude Rains' popularity. But it is mostly forgotten today. You can't come into my house. You can't take away my job. I'm a free man. Strange Holiday is an example of wartime propaganda, exploration of societal fears, and political cinema, with a popular actor at its center to serve as an early example of a government invasion narrative. But this ends up feeling more like an episode of The Twilight Zone rather than a fully realized feature film. The behind the scenes making of the film and its journey to the cinema is more intriguing than the finished film itself. This is clearly a short film stretched into an hour with a lot of repetition of plot points. The director keeps going back to footage of Rain's character in jail rather than fully exploring the town after the takeover by an unnamed country. Bootleg DVDs of Strange Holiday are available online and is streaming on YouTube, which I'll link in the description below if you would like to check it out. The Man in Half Moon Street is a lesser-known science fiction romantic melodrama directed by Ralph Murphy and produced by Paramount Pictures. The film tells the haunting story of Dr. Julian Carell, a scientist who discovers a method of prolonging his life indefinitely by harvesting the glands from human victims, retaining the appearance of a 35-year-old man. He falls in love with Eve, a young woman curious about his past, while his colleague, Dr. Van Bruken, struggles with guilt over their unethical practices. As the police investigation looms, Corral's desperate need for another operation escalates. It is impossible today not to see the comparisons to the film version of Oscar Wilde's novella, The Picture of Dorian Gray, which was released by MGM a few months after The Man in Half Moon Street. But it is actually adapted from the 1939 West End stage play of the same name. The film would later inspire the 1959 British film The Man Who Could Cheat Death by Hammer Productions. The crew has some connections to past and future sci-fi classics. The cinematography by Henry Sharp, known for his work on 1940s Dr. Cyclops, while the makeup was created by Wally Westmore, the son of famed George Westmore. Wally would go on to work on When Worlds Collide and The War of the Worlds. Swedish heartthrob Niels Astor plays Dr. Carell. Helen Walker, an American actress known for her work on television, stage, and screen, portrays Eve Brandon, the object of Carell's affection. Reinhold Schunzel, a German actor and director, delivers a compelling performance as the guilt-ridden Dr. von Brücken. The film explores complex ethical dilemmas as Dr. Carell's quest for immortality 
becomes increasingly urgent. His declining health and need for another life-saving procedure coincide with his deepening love for Eve, complicating his desires for both eternal life and human connection. Exploring the darker aspects of medical experimentation and moral responsibility. It is dialogue heavy due to its stage play origins, but it does treat its science fiction themes seriously, staying away from the campy mad scientists that were popular at the time. Today, it is probably known more for its similarities to the picture of Dorian Gray, if it's remembered at all. There's some good cinematography here, along with set design, that does make the production feel more expensive. There are not a lot of visual effects, but they are used at the most dramatic time. The Man in Half Moon Street is available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as streaming on the Internet Archive. The Jade Mask, directed by Phil Rosen, is the 37th installment of the Charlie Chan series, produced by Monogram Pictures, and revolves around the mysterious murder of an eccentric scientist named Harper. The story unfolds in Harper's eerie mansion, which is filled with secret passages, hidden labs, and strange characters, all potential suspects with motives for murder. Sidney Toller, as our famous crime solver, leads the cast. Manton Moreland, who we last saw in 1943's Revenge of the Zombies, works as Chan's assistant. This is one of those barely kind of sci-fi films with tech gadgets and experiments that put it in the genre. If you can get past Chan's fortune cookie quotes, it's an okay murder mystery. So I did want to give this film a brief mention of how gadgets and scientists can be used in murder mysteries and how technology was used to tell stories in the 1940s. But it is a pretty cheesy film by today's standards. The Jade Mask is available on DVD and streaming for free on YouTube and the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. Robots have returned to our series with The Monster and the Ape, directed by Howard Bretherton, a 15-chapter serial featuring robots and a human-controlled ape. Produced by Columbia Pictures, the story revolves around Professor Franklin Arnold, who invents a revolutionary robot called the Metalogian Man. However, this invention attracts the attention of the villainous Professor Ernst, who uses a trained ape named Thor to steal the robot for his own dark purposes. Professor Arnold, his daughter Babs, and investigator Ken Morgan embark on a series of dangerous adventures to thwart Ernst and recover the stolen robot. Howard Bretherton, a prolific director and film editor with over 100 films to his name, Helm this serial with a cast including Robert Lowry as Ken Morgan, who we'll see again in 1949's Batman and Robin, Ralph Morgan as Professor Arnold, Carol Matthews as Babs Arnold, George McCready as the villainous Professor Ernst, and Ray Corrigan as Thor the Ape, known for his numerous ape roles in Hollywood. If you see an ape or an ape-like creature in 1930s or 1940s films, like the Orangopoid in 1936's Flash Gordon, it was most likely Corrigan in the suit. Despite its intriguing premise, The Monster and the Ape didn't take full advantage of what made this story unique for the mid-1940s. The robot and the ape were underutilized, leading to a somewhat anticlimactic conclusion, especially since we never get to see the two in a cool fight during the final episode. The monster of the title is a robot that is more of a background actor than a main character. The pace is slow, and like many serials, the story is repetitive, and the ending is pretty dull. It's great to see more robots, and I wish there were fights between the monster and the ape, especially a final battle in the last episode, rather than resorting to typical fistfights between humans. The Monster and the Ape is available on DVD and streaming on Tubi TV and YouTube. Manhunt of Mystery Island was Republic's 36th serial. It offered audiences 15 chapters of suspense, action, and sci-fi intrigue, with a story revolving around the kidnapping of Professor William Forrest, a brilliant scientist 
who invented a groundbreaking energy device. His daughter, Claire, teams up with a private detective, Lance Reardon, to rescue him. Their investigation leads them to the remote Mystery Island, where they encounter the descendant of the infamous pirate Captain Mephisto, who uses a transformation machine to disguise himself as a dead pirate captain. The serial was directed by three men, including Spencer Gordon Bennett, known as the King of Serial Directors. Bennett was joined by Yakima Kanut, a former rodeo rider and stuntman who brought his expertise and action sequences to the production, and Wallace Grissel, a British director and film editor. Republic also brought in six of their biggest writers of the time, including Basil Dickey, Alan James, and Grant Nelson. The cast is led by Richard Bailey as Lance Reardon, one of his early film roles, and Linda Sterling as Clara Forrest, who we'll see again in the final serial in this chapter. Roy Barcroft, a veteran of over 300 Republic films, plays the villainous Higgins and Mephisto. The production was over budget and cost over $182,000. Despite these financial challenges, the serial had some decent action sequences and a likable cast. However, it was not without its criticisms. Like many serials, the story is repetitive and includes a recap episode to reuse footage and save on production cost. They even reused footage of Mephisto sitting in his transformation chair in multiple episodes. The serial was later edited into a 100-minute television film titled Captain Mephisto and the Transformation Machine in 1966. But its most enduring legacy is how it influenced one future film. The rope bridge scene in Chapter 13 inspired George Lucas and Steven Spielberg's bridge scene in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Manhunt of Mystery Island is available on DVD and streaming on Tubi TV and YouTube. Monster Strikes was Republic Pictures' first post-war serial that features a storyline that would become popular in the 1950s, an alien invasion of Earth. The story begins with a Martian spacecraft crash-landing near the observatory of Dr. Cyrus Layton, who is on the brink of completing Earth's first spaceship. The lone survivor of the crash, a Martian known as the Purple Monster, is here to steal Layton's advanced jet plane designs and prepare for a Martian invasion of Earth. The Purple Monster kills Dr. Layton and assumes his identity, setting off a confrontation with Layton's niece Sheila and criminologist Craig Foster. Directed by Manhunt of Mystery Island's Spencer Gordon Bennett, he's joined this time by Fred C. Brannon. Brannon would go on to direct the sequel Flying Disc Man from Mars in 1950, which reused footage from this production. Dennis Moore, known for his roles in westerns, plays Craig Foster, while Linda Sterling plays Sheila Layton. Roy Barcroft is the menacing purple monster. James Craven plays Dr. Cyrus Layton, and John Davidson appears as the Emperor of Mars. The production was over budget and ended up costing almost $184,000 making it the most expensive Republic serial of the year. The special effects crafted by the Lidecker brothers were a highlight, particularly the crash scene. The alien invader represents wartime and post-war fears of invasion and identity theft, themes that resonated with audiences in the 40s and 50s. The costume for the Purple Monster would be reused in Flying Disc Man from Mars in 1950, and Radar Men from the Moon in 1952. And the serial itself was re-released in theaters in 1957 and later edited for television in 1966 as D-Day on Mars. Despite its formulaic plot, The Purple Monster Strikes is remembered today as a classic Republic serial with its action and cliffhangers. It can be seen as a bridge between World War II and Cold War era science fiction, with themes of invasion and paranoia that would become prevalent in 1950s sci-fi films. Aliens and their planned invasion 
is a wonderful change of pace from the mad scientist and monster films I've covered over the last few episodes, and gives us a glimpse into what the next decade will bring. It is made on the cheap, and there's no actual invasion, so they can save money on the production. The Purple Monster Strikes is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube at the Internet Archive. I've linked all the films discussed today in the description below if you would like to check them out. The dropping of the atomic bomb in August deeply influenced science fiction literature for the rest of the decade and into the 1950s, leading writers to later explore darker, more complex themes beyond mere technological fantasies. Some of the novels and short stories of the year include A.E. Van Vogt's The World of Null A, serialized in astounding science fiction, explores a society ruled by non-Aristotelian logic. The story follows one man as he unravels the mystery of his identity in a world where a powerful machine controls lives through a high-stakes game. That Hideous Strength, C.S. Lewis's third book in his space trilogy, blends science fiction and fantasy to examine the clash between scientific materialism and spirituality. The novel addresses power and ethics, continuing the philosophical themes of the earlier books. Destiny Times 3 by Fritz Leiber explores a world of alternate timelines, enabled by the probability engine. The main character uncovers a conspiracy involving parallel realities, delving into identity, power, and reality manipulation. Harry Kuttner's The Piper's Son, written under the pseudonym Lewis Paget, was published in Astounding Science Fiction. This post-apocalyptic tale, where telepathic mutants called Baldies coexist with humans. Murray Leinster's First Contact introduced the concept of a universal translator and explored trust and cooperation between civilizations during a first encounter in space. The Second World War spanned 2,194 days, from September 1, 1939 to September 2, 1945, and was the deadliest conflict in human history, with an estimated 70 to 85 million lives lost. To fully understand the science fiction cinema of the late 1940s and 1950s, it's essential to consider the broader historical and cultural backdrop, and so for the rest of this episode, I'll explore key historical, cultural, and cinematic events from 1945. The year began with the Soviet Army liberating Warsaw from German occupation on January 17th. On January 20th, Franklin Roosevelt was sworn in for his fourth term as president. The liberation of Auschwitz and Birkenau concentration camps occurred on January 27th. The Yalta Conference held from February 4th to the 11th, saw Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin discussing the post-war reorganization of Europe, setting the stage for the future global order. As the war in the Pacific raged on, the Battle of Iwo Jima took place from February 19th to March 26th, with the U.S. forces capturing the strategic island from Japan. But the world was shocked by the death of President Roosevelt on April 12th, leading to Vice President Harry Truman assuming the presidency. The liberation of the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp on April 15th, followed by the fierce Battle of Berlin from April 16th to May 2nd, and ending with Adolf Hitler's suicide on April 30th, marked the fall of Nazi Germany. And its unconditional surrender on May 7th led to the celebration of victory in Europe, VE Day, on May 8th. The Trinity Test, the first successful test of an atomic bomb, occurred on July 16th in New Mexico. Shortly after, at the Potsdam Conference, from July 17th to August 2nd, Allied leaders discussed the post-World War II reorganization of Europe. The atomic bombings of Hiroshima on August 6th and Nagasaki on August 9th, along with the Soviet invasion of Manchuria, forced Japan's surrender on August 15th 
with the formal surrender on September 2nd aboard the USS Missouri. The year closed with the founding of the United Nations on October 24th and the beginning of the Nuremberg Trials on November 20th, setting the stage for the Cold War and a new world order. With the end of the war, global culture began to recover, innovate, and set the stage for the post-war era in arts and entertainment. In May, Allied forces uncovered 6,500 Nazi-looted paintings in Austria's salt mines. This discovery marked a significant effort to restore stolen cultural treasures to their rightful owners, symbolizing the broader recovery of European heritage after the war's devastation. The comic book industry thrived in 1945, with the introduction of characters like Black Adam in Marvel Family Comics No. 1 and Superboy in More Fun Comics No. 101. Italy's post-war renaissance in comics, sparked by the end of fascist censorship, led to the release of influential titles like Asso di Pica and Topolino, revitalizing the Italian comic scene. Several theatrical productions premiered this year, including J.B. Priestley's An Inspector Calls, a play that delves into the social responsibility and moral accountability within a British family, and Rodgers and Hammerstein's Carousel captivated audiences with its mix of romance, tragedy, and timeless musical numbers. The literary world was shaped by influential works like George Orwell's Animal Farm, Evelyn Wall's Brideshead Revisited, and John Steinbeck's Canary Row, each delved into subjects of power, society, and human nature. Television broadcasting rapidly expanded in the post-war period, with the U.S. transitioning from experimental to regular programming, and war-torn areas reopening stations in France and Moscow, setting the stage for television's dominance in the 1950s. In another part of the camp, they showed me the children, hundreds of them. Some were only six. One rolled up his sleeve, showed me his number. It was tattooed on his arm. B-6030 it was. The others showed me their numbers. They will carry them till they die. Journalist Edward R. Murrow's April 1945 report from Buchenwald brought the atrocities committed by the Nazis to the forefront of public consciousness. And on a fun note, we end the cultural discussion with the first demonstration of the Slinky, a simple yet innovative toy that quickly became an iconic example of mid-20th century toy design. Lastly, the scientific events and discoveries that contributed to the advancement of knowledge in various fields. The completion of the ENIAC The first general-purpose electronic digital computer marked a major advancement in computational power. John von Neumann's first draft of a report on the EDVAC introduced stored program architecture, a key principle for modern computing. The Smith Report, released in August, detailed nuclear fission's role in the development of the atomic bomb emphasizing the significant impact of physics on warfare and the far-reaching implications of nuclear technology. Arthur C. Clarke proposed the idea of a geosynchronous communication satellite, a concept that would become central to modern telecommunications. And dictation devices like the Soundscriber and Gray Autograph revolutionized voice recording. This year marked a pivotal moment in cinema, as Hollywood faced both opportunities and challenges in the post-war era. The impact of Olivia de Havilland's landmark 1943 lawsuit against Warner Brothers, which was decided in her favor in December 1944, began to reverberate throughout the industry this year, as it limited the duration of an actor's contract to seven years. This legal precedent dramatically altered the power dynamics between actors and studios, granting performers more creative freedom. The top grossing films in the United States were The Bells of St. Mary's, Leave Her to Heaven, and Spellbound. The 18th Academy Awards were held on March 7, 1946. 
This first ceremony, held after the end of the war, saw the return of gold-plated bronze statuettes, replacing the plaster statues that had been used during the war years. The Bells of St. Mary's, the first sequel to be nominated for Best Picture, was the most nominated film of the year with eight, but took home only one award. Joan Crawford won Best Actress for Mildred Pierce, but it was the lost weekend that dominated the ceremony taking home four Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Director for Billy Wilder, and Best Actor for Ray Milland. It tells the story of an alcoholic writer as he spirals into a desperate and self-destructive binge over a difficult four-day weekend. Cinema outside of Hollywood began to recover in 1945, with significant contributions from Italian and British filmmakers. Roberto Rossellini's Rome Open City, a cornerstone of Italian neorealism, depicts the harsh realities of life in Nazi-occupied Rome, blending documentary-style filmmaking with intense human drama. David Lean's Blythe Spirit is a witty supernatural comedy about a man haunted by the mischievous ghost of his first wife. While Brief Encounter, also directed by Lean, tells the story of a forbidden romance between two married people. Hollywood continued to produce some popular films and future classics, including The Bells of St. Mary's. This heartwarming sequel to Going My Way starred Bing Crosby as Father O'Malley, who teams up with Sister Benedict, played by Ingrid Bergman, to save a struggling Catholic school. Spellbound, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, This gripping thriller follows a psychiatrist played by Ingrid Bergman as she works to unravel the mystery surrounding an amnesiac patient played by Gregory Peck. The Picture of Dorian Gray, directed by Albert Lewin and starring George Sanders, follows the story of a man who remains eternally youthful while a portrait of him ages and reflects the corruption of his soul. Anchors Away In this lively musical, Gene Kelly and Frank Sinatra play sailors on leave in Hollywood who embark on a series of entertaining adventures while helping a young, aspiring singer. National Velvet This film received a limited release in 1944 and a wider national release in January 1945 and tells the story of Elizabeth Taylor as Velvet Brown, a determined young girl who dreams of winning the Grand National Steeplechase. Mildred Pierce. Joan Crawford delivers a powerful performance as Mildred, a woman who rises from poverty to success in the restaurant business during the Great Depression, but her unrelenting ambition leads to a tragic personal downfall. And finally, they were expendable. Directed by John Ford, this war drama chronicles the bravery of P.T. Boat Cruise during World War II. The film follows a group of men as they face intense naval battles in the Philippines emphasizing matters of duty, sacrifice, and the human spirit. Nineteen forty-five marked a pivotal year for science fiction cinema, blending the familiar themes of monsters and mad scientists with new explorations of alternate realities, robots, and extraterrestrial threats. As the world grappled with the aftermath of World War II and the dawn of the atomic age, these films not only entertained but also reflected the anxieties and hopes of a society on the brink of profound technological change. As we move forward, these early depictions of science fiction will continue to influence and shape the genre as it evolves into its golden age in the 1950s. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more history of sci-fi content. And I'd like to give a shout out to my Patreon supporters. Thank you for all your encouragement, and I will see all of you in 1946.